I want to welcome you to another episode of the Green Focus podcast hosted by me, Yaron Damlin. I'm CEO of Focus IP, IP management consultancy based in Israel. And the aim of this podcast is to discover and show, showcase transformative Israeli green technology and help advance the ecosystem to make a serious impact globally. Okay, now today's guest is Ariel Averbach. He's an angel investor and a patent attorney. One of ours. Okay. Now, besides being an angel investor and patent attorney, Ariel's an attorney at law, pharmacist, an entrepreneur, a business consultant, and an author. So his one book is a patent in the palm of your hand. And he also heads an institute in Israel called Profit First Israel. Okay. And you're also founder of Marketing, My Kerting, something like that. You can help me pronounce that. How do you pronounce that name? Yeah, it, it is Mar Kerting which is okay. the marketing with care. Marketing with care. It sounds so sweet. Yeah. Maybe we'll have time to elaborate later what you mean about that. And maybe it's connected to trademarks. We will speak about this, okay? Cool. So Ariel, besides those uh, great uh, uh, experiences in the past, he specializes in agro and food tech. Now, it's interesting, okay? Because I've known Ariel for probably 15 years or so. We, we worked together at a certain time. Uh, many years back. Um, I think we had a yeah, cool time working together back then. And then we took a long break, haven't seen or spoken to each other for a long time. And uh, we reconnected recently. And I realized that we are possibly um, like, you know, kind of sharing a vision to some degree. We're both seeing, um, we're both working with technology, we're working with IP. And we're trying to work with these two hand in hand to promote progress. And not only progress, substantial progress and impact, but we're both doing it in the green related sphere. We both want to make an impact on the earth, on the world. We want to feed the people better and we want to protect their earth better and give our grandchildren a much nicer planet. On this juncture, I just want to introduce something new is that I recently became a grandparent. Uh, so on last week, I became a grandparent of a great, beautiful little grandchild. And um, so now it's become personal. Until now, I was talking about the theory of maybe we'll do something good for our kids and grandkids. Now it's personal. Okay, I've got skin in the game. So on that note, uh, we're going to go forward. We're going to charge forward and understand. I want to I want to try and explore Ariel together with you today. And um, you know, because we're in a similar space to some degree. Um, your vision, okay, like your narrative of as well, where you seeing this kind of a uh, climate crisis this uh, earth moving towards net zero process and making all the mistakes on the way and the technology challenges to get there. Um, I know that you've chosen, as I have, to go and kind of get services to this uh, field and to the space. And I want to understand what led you to start, um, you know, trying to make that difference by going into that space and by wanting to make your impact on that space. So I'll start off with one or two simple questions and then we'll get more uh, hectic. But uh, when did you get first interested in the green climate tech space? Well, first of all, congratulations, you know, on, uh, Thank you. Grandpa. You know, I can't, I can't <laughs> imagine <laughs> how you energetic young Yaron already is a grandpa. But, you know, um, for <laughs> me, I always felt a sense of, of concern regarding the future. But only in the past few years, I've actually felt a sense of urgency. Something needs to be done. And, you know, I think every individual who cares thinks about, like, what can I do? Okay, so I'll recycle. I'll, you know, I'm not going to use plastic bags or whatever. But technically, I always thought that I can do more. So my focus on green technologies, on food tech, on agro has been growing with along the years with, with more and more clients coming, um, you know, from that field. But I honestly believe that we have no time to waste in that sense. So when I say green energy, green uh, green focus, as you call it, which is I think is it's a wonderful name, it's something that should not be relevant to only a small percentage of the population. Everybody should should worry about it. And the first time I I encountered uh, a very troubling statistics is when I saw that. By 2050, we will have to um, enlarge food consumption by 70%. We will not be able to feed the 9 billion people on Earth if we stay on the same route that we are now. 
And I was wondering, okay, there's like a huge global problem. What can I as an individual do? But then I joined the program um, facilitated by MIT in which various entrepreneurs from various fields were all concerned with the same problem. So I kind of made it personal. And that's why I actually made the conscious choice on focusing on those technologies, promoting them in my firm as a patent attorney, but promoting them as, a, as an angel investor, choosing <clears throat> to focus on those technologies. Because uh, this is not, you know, it's like hundreds of years away. This is less than 30 years away. You don't even need to get to be a grandpa. You will see it yourself. So um, that's why I, I've chosen to focus in that field. Okay, thanks for the introduction because it really does set up the agenda. You know, I was just listening to a podcast very recently and um, even more so than you were saying, you know, we thought, okay, it may happen. It may happen 10, 20, 30 years. Right this week in Europe, we can see a drought of the greatest proportions on record. Rivers, central rivers, which not only flow water, they help with uh, energy production on a massive scale. And uh, and the, the U European continent at the moment are suffering from a major drought and major food shortages without the Russian uh, invasion of, of Ukraine being even on besides that. Um, we're seeing quite something quite dramatic happening around us, okay? Whether you ascribe all of that to uh, human interactions and interventions or whether partially, it doesn't matter right now. But there's massive stuff happening, and it's happening much sooner than we even thought. Okay, so now um, taking that uh, from the generic towards, in a sense, the food tech. Okay, so you've gone and honed in on a space that says, okay, we're going to um, soon feed nine billion people with whatever challenges the climate is offering us. Okay, um, like is that the place where you are seeing is going to make the biggest difference, and in food tech specifically? Let's give a bit of a, um, a question. Like, how does the food tech is fine? It's a certain tech space, let's call it. But obviously, that is to interact, interact with the big system, okay, the global, the energy supply, for example, and the climate. So, how do you see that as fitting into the big picture? So, first of all, I have to tell you that I think most of the people realize that we have a problem, but it's still not affecting your fridge. You know, you still have everything you need on a daily basis. Even in Europe, even the fact that, you know, they're, they, they had like, I don't know, 100 degrees lately, and they're, they're melting there. People are still feeling that this problem is far away. And for me, food tech and agro tech are something which uh, foresees the future. So, for example, let's talk about a specific technology, which I found very interesting, which is now being researched all over the world. In I think it's a combination of agro tech and food tech, and it's the insect uh field the insect technology well you know humans are are looking for other sources of protein for for a while now uh but the insects have been some sort of a neglected field in the sense of what can we do with them on a large scale right so one of the technologies which, which i found extremely fascinating is a specific fly called the black soldier fly and I've been investing time, energy, money, whatever you want in those technologies. Uh, and I've seen governments also being becoming aware of this technology. Mm. So what this fly does, just like briefly, uh, the fly doesn't do anything, basically. It's not a pest. It doesn't even eat. Uh, the fly leaves for about, I think it lives for about 10 days, something like that. And then it dies. It just, you know, reproduces and then it dies. But the larva, that's the that's the the golden part. The larva basically doubles its size every day, and it eats anything organic which you want. So, mm -hmm. you know, consumes human waste or whatever waste you want, which is organic. It becomes a huge larva which you can dry up and use as food for animals, for fish. The secretions of the larva throughout its growth period become it's called the frass. It becomes a fertilizer. So this amazing fly could be the source for us as humans, for alternative proteins, uh, for feeding animals and, you know, freeing up more food for us humans, uh, like corn and stuff, which we kind of compete with, uh, yeah. with animals on. Um, and that's only like, uh, on a, like as a nutshell, a, a specific technology that I think will play a huge role in the next few years 
uh, in terms of investments, in terms of technologies, of patents, of of, and that's only one insect. I recently visited a startup here in Israel dealing with this fly. And the CEO said something amazing. He said, you know, on planet Earth, we have about 6 million insect species, but we are only using two of them, the silkworm and the honeybee as humans. And I found that fascinating. So I think... Um, I think we have a lot to explore, but I think we're on the verge of coming up with something. Uh, and that was just one insect, right? The BSF. So, so that is the thing. That, that's amazing. I love that story, okay? Um, because there's this kind of also competing side, uh, a conf conflict inside of me. On the one hand, we have to do really hard work, all of us, as individuals, as societies, to improve our behaviors, our behaviors. And we need to do that. And I'm not running away from that at all. But then there's the whole technology angle. And technology, uh, you know, we kind of, we both of us, we're working on the threshold of new technologies. Now they always, often they take longer than you think, and often they fail more than you think, but there's fantastic promise out there, okay? And that is, I think, what we're both uh, seeing and feeling. So with the concern and with the sudden, like, panic of sorts of, wow, this thing's coming fast and furious, we maybe both share a certain optimism that we're going to hunt down, we're going to mine we're going to hunt for that new tech because that tech is going to make massive impact. Not that tech solves all our problems. We've been there before. We've done that. And every tech has also got a consequence. But there's major room for optimism as well. And that's what we are here to, in a sense, uh, discover. Okay. True. True. So, so on that thing, I'm going to start off now asking you, besides your angle in terms of the, the agro tech and the stuff, you as a as an angel investor, right? You're looking to invest in startups. What is the secret sauce? that you actually hone in on and look for when you consider investing in projects? Uh, the people, definitely the people. It's like 80% the people, 20% the technology, as, as weird as it might sound, because everybody talks about the technology. I even spoke about it right now, right? The BSF technology. Exactly. But it's the people who actually make it a success or a failure. And what specifically about the people, the people I look at is, you know, their devotion, their expertise, their experience in the field. And um, and I think that is by far more important. I saw amazing patents fail because the people who were leading the project, for example, I can tell you, you know, uh, many times the inventors are professionals in their field, but they have no clue on how to run a company successfully, on how to raise funds, on how to negotiate, strategize. But they are amazing inventors, but they're so in love with their ideas. That's why they want to lead the company. More often than not, that would probably be a mistake for the long run. It's good for the early stages. For the long run, you would need somebody else to actually lead the company and let the inventor focus on what they do best. Um, development, probably. Uh, so often for me, when I'm like in, in, in meetings of that sort, I'm actually inquiring a lot about the person, a bit less about the technology. Obviously, the technology is important. Obviously, I go and analyze the patents. Obviously, I do all that. But that's that always looks great, you know? Always inventor, investor pitches always sound promising. Everything sounds promising. Nobody comes and says, ah, my technology is like that. Ah. Everybody says it's amazing. It's the next best thing. But that's uh, that's the thing that I look at, the people. Because we can kind of simplify that formula and say the Pareto principle of investing, according to Ariel, is 80 20. 80 on the people, 20 on the technology. Um, but uh, I'm kind of um, imbibed with confidence because you, know, you do technology, you understand technology, you're not anti and avoiding technology, but you're giving the human dimension a great proportion of your energy, which is fantastic. Okay. Now, we are currently as well. Um, Kind of witnessing in this in this major trend towards uh, you know kind of uh, net zero in 2050, suddenly wars appear and suddenly coal mines are reopened and all these things we didn't expect, right? And um, along with that, we see a global recession. We see I don't know. We're just seeing, as they say in 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 Israel, balagan, okay, craziness, whatever, <laughs> mess up, whatever, noisiness. Now, how do you see the the green tech sector placed? to handle this possible meltdown 
Um, the money invested already in it, is it, is it there or is it still in potential? You know, are we seeing that this thing could dry up and all this energy we're seeing invested into the green space may not really be here when we need it? No, I, I honestly think that it will be here. I, I think that people are realizing this is not a luxury. You know, money has to be invested. And, you know, even though we see a, a big recession, it's, you know, it looks like it's only in its early stages. Um, it is not something that is surprising, not for me, at least. If you look at trends throughout human history, you know, it's coming and going. There's no way around it. But the green technology, as we started, you know, saying in the beginning of our conversation, is not something that is a nice to have. It's becoming a must. So just like governments are investing money in security and it doesn't look like it's going to go away, I think green technology is not something that is um, a trend. It's something here to stay because I think we've passed some sort of a threshold that we can go back. Uh, we try to fix stuff. We try to you know, minimize the harm that we as humankind have you know, caused to this planet, but it's not going to go away. So I don't think uh, we have other options but to invest in this uh, field. As you know, as I, said, yeah, that's it. I, I take your point loud and strong. Um, as what I've kind of said before, the this kind of goalpost of 2050. You now that's not the old, only goalpost. That's just one of them, but it sticks in all our minds. It's been drilled into our brains already. But it's interesting because. Um, you know, when you think it's 20, 23, 20, whatever, 26, 27 years ahead, we are, you know, we've got a long-term plan over here, okay? This isn't for the short-hearted, for the, for, for the faint-hearted, for the short-minded, short-sighted. This is something we need to, like, really, we've got a long kind of runway here we need to play with, and things take time, and we can see it now, right? You're talking about all these new technologies and the mixes of technology, and the fact is the rollouts, even talk about PV and about wind, the rollouts take a long time with the paces increasing, the technology is improving, but it still takes mega time to put out enough um, panels out there to make enough energy. It's going to take many, many years. And along with that, the nuclear, every time you set up a new nuclear station, if that's what you're going for, many years. So we're talking about a long game over here. We need to, and we need to readjust the whole infrastructure and economy around that. So that's why we've got plenty of challenges laid out for us. The next question I actually wanted to ask you um, was about kind of these really green tech companies, how did they, in your opinion, place on a global scale? How do they compete with their uh, associates and competitors internationally? Well, you know, it's not my opinion. There are so many statistics on that. We are ranked way up there in the top 10. I think I saw like we are sixth or seventh in terms of green technologies, in terms of investments, in terms of, you know, new developments. There's no doubt about it. Israel has been leading and will probably continue leading everything related to agro, to food tech, because we got everything here um, to support that. We got, you know, a small space in which you have to produce efficiently and, and quickly and, and feed the population. Mm -hmm. We got all sorts of, of, I don't know if you can call it climate, but you got cold up north, you got warm desert down in the south. Um, you have everything in order to support novel technologies in terms of green tech, but Israel as, as an innovative state, I think is supporting those startups. That's what I see. I've been involved with, with ICL for a decade now. I've been, uh, I've been the patent attorney for, uh, for many of the patents and they have set up a hub to invest in those types of startups because I think companies, large companies, see that this is not a fade. This is not something that will go away. So specifically looking for Israeli technologies, focusing on green tech is something that has become a major part of the portfolio for a reason. So I don't think it's just a matter of my opinion. I chose this field because I felt a sense of urgency, but also I see that this is not going to fade away. This is only going to grow. But I think other big companies also see that as well and will invest a lot of money and the government as well. It's, a, it's amazing. Adding to that, you know, there's that old statement. I don't know where it comes from, but I think it's a necessity is the mother of innovation, something yeah. like that. And it's interesting because here we are, this little like desert uh, uh, spot in the Middle East, um, with so many 
challenges. And it just simply drove us to a situation for over the last seven years that we have had to innovate to survive. Okay. Now, um, back to the water example. So Europe was just water rich. Why do they need to think about storing water and recycling water and looking after water and desalinating water? It wasn't on the agenda. And yet we have had that on the agenda, having a water carrier to transfer water for since the beginning of the state, okay, since 48. Now, that's crazy because we kind of like, not that we chose this pathway, but we've had to preempt something which now exists in many, many places. You know, the, the Changxi, the river, the greatest, the fourth, third greatest river in Europe or in the world, I think, actually, and it's just is drying up in large sections in China now. This is crazy. And not in the effects, uh, the effects of uh, on agriculture and economy and everything else. It's insane. So in a sense, we've been there. We've done a lot of stuff because we just needed to do it. Okay. Added to that, I share another optimism, and it's something you hinted at before, or I'm not sure. But you know, Israel's startup culture is um, amazing and energetic. Along with that comes the greatest um, rate of failure of startups in the world, which I think is part of the parcel. But as you said then before, the fact that you're focused on people, those failures can easily get translated into future successes. True. So um, I don't see that as a failure. It's a policy. Go out there and innovate and uh, deal with the consequences. And uh, that's, that's actually, why that's actually one them. of my questions when I actually interview entrepreneurs before investing is tell me about things that did not succeed as well as you wanted them to. I, did, I do not define them as failure like you don't, but this is basically what it you know drives to. I want to hear about the stuff that did not work out, why, what what was the gap? That will tell you a lot about the future success of, of that specific entrepreneur. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot of that around. So, uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Good for you. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, talking about um, green tech transformative technologies, do you have any feeling, intuition about what's the next big thing we're going to see coming out of Israel in the sector? Well, uh, I'm just going to revert back to my uh, previous example of the BSF just because I truly believe in that. You know, there are a lot of stuff. Um, I have some clients dealing with um, with alternative proteins, some clients dealing with uh, with different milk sources, creating milk from other sources. But the BSF, the the reason I, I believe in that so strongly and you hear me like preaching about it for some reason, it sounds like I'm like uh, totally preaching about BSF is because I think it solves various problems simultaneously and the reason i like it is because you mentioned briefly that i brought to israel that specific method for financial management called profit first and i do believe that if you want a specific technology to truly succeed you will have to find some sort of financial model which will not only make it easy it will make it drastically easier for people to see the financial benefits of this and so many good technologies fail, not because they're bad, but because, you know, it's not totally worth it to other people to switch whatever they're doing now in order to save the planet and save just a few more cents. No, it has to be save, save a lot. And that BSF technology, uh, it has super financial models. It's not just smart, super smart financial models which make it very lucrative. And that's why I believe in it, because I think it will succeed because so many people involved in it will make a lot of money whilst creating a better future. Just Ariel, maybe just elaborate a little bit on the BSF technology, the definitions there, so the listeners can uh, grab it without doing further research. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't do it. So basically, as I, I briefly spoke about the fly and the larva. So the larva eats whatever organic, organic waste you give to it, it grows, becomes uh, a huge larva, and then you can use it, dry it up, and use it as animal feed. So you basically can sell it. You let it eat your waste, and then that waste becomes valuable in terms of, of monetary value. And you're also processing waste, basically. You're getting rid of stuff you don't want. Yeah, you're getting rid of stuff. You can use it for whatever animal manure. You can use it for plant sewage. You can use it for whatever you want. Because they basically eat everything. Uh, for example, one example, it doesn't have to be gross, right? It, one example is that farmers get rid, on average, of 30% of their yield, of their crops. 30% goes to waste for various reasons. Some of the reasons is, but, is because the vegetables don't look perfect. 
And the consumers today have to have their yeah. perfect yeah. tomato. So about 30% goes to waste. All right, no, 30% you invested labor, water, everything. That 30%, if it's eaten by that larva, and that larva can be sold further and worth is worth money for the farmer, you basically drop down the carbon emission because that vegetable or fruit rotting in the ground causes carbon emission. You get rid of that. You help the farmer make a lot of money in the process. As I mentioned, the the secretions of the larva is fertilizer. It's like, that's amazing. So everybody benefits from it, but there are so many smart financial models behind it because it's worth money that that's why I believe it will succeed. Okay, so I'm gonna, I mean, I could just keep on speaking to you about all these examples for a long time. I'm trying to keep the podcast to a reasonable level. And so I want to move on to now a couple of other challenging questions, which one of them, for example, is like getting into the IP side of things, right? Um, we both do IP. And I'm asking you in particular how IP relates to what we call these days the circular economy, okay? Now, just a bit of background I will just give out. Um, you know, the circular economy, it's a term used today describing the need to kind of pre-program and develop the economy around the principle that not um, we don't just take use and abuse and throw things away we program um, recycling and reusing into the system itself so that the producers for example the manufacturers may often have responsibility for that end product to bring it back to recycle it to reuse it in some way so it goes back into the system because we can't rely on infinite resources to keep on providing what humans demand we need to start massively um, re re-entering all our waste into the system again so that we cut down on the need for new resources from nature, for example. So that being said, a little introduction at least, um, how do you see IP playing in this new kind of circular economy, which I, I don't know what you think about it. I think it's happening. I, I totally think it's happening and I can actually see it, you know, happening because I think companies are realizing that they're, you know, inventing something or having something in the pipeline to to promote the company, that's one thing. But when you actually think of a circular economy and when you actually invest in it, that becomes a different thing. And, you know, IP is a major, is, is like a major thing in most serious companies' strategy to, to promote themselves. So I see IP playing a role in that because IP is the driving force behind innovation. It creates the platform for companies to innovate. If there was no IP protection, they would think twice whether it's worth it. It actually comes back to my previous idea of financial models. If there's no financial drive behind it, you know, you can only do so much volunteer work. You can only, you know, help out the uh, community so much as a company I'm talking about, you know, as, as profit-driven big companies. But now when you have IP behind it, and not in the sense of blocking others, but in the sense of getting rewarded for your investment in this, I think there's no way around it. It will actually you know, become more and more evident that companies are investing in circular economies, filing patents for that, and you know, having the incentive to come up with more and more ideas in that sense. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, that's a big point. And I mean, I've got a lot of thoughts about this issue. Um, that we need the new models and we need to, there will be major innovation around these models because the models are going to be shifting, I think, quite radically. I think we really, if the if the shift to a circular economy um, really happens in a substantial way, which I kind of think we both, I think it's going to happen. Okay, it's going to take time. But the, the fundamentals of the economy are going to be shifting, okay? Not throwing things out, but they're going to be shifting in substantial ways. We need to be covering that. We need to be aware of that. We need to be working with that. And um, also, like, for example, throwing out the carbon economy, right? The carbon economy, um, it's going to, it's already happening, obviously, and it's going to be happening more and more that if you aren't playing your part, you're going to be sued for it. You're going to be held accountable for, the, accountable for that. And it's going to be a major um, harassment to your bottom line. Okay, so you have to mitigate that. And you have to invest in the alternative. Because if you aren't invested in some kind of, um, you know, positive carbon credit story, you're going to, as a company, as, a, as an investor, or whatever, are going to not see, um, you know, your results and your and your you're not going to accrue your rewards. Okay, the opposite. So, so we're going to have to see a major like stuff happening over there. It's interesting uh, thinking about patents, right? So patents we usually talk about about a twenty year 
um, you know, a live period of being alive and active, and then it goes to the public domain. Uh, well, I mean, it's in the public domain for the 20 years, but then it gets shared and the monopoly ends. Now, the thing with patents is that the whole system is built around that principle that we want to encourage people to share their technology. Because if you keep your technology inside and don't share it, eventually the inventor may die, okay, the company may close, and the world will not benefit from that technology. Now, when it's interesting because when you contrast that with, with trade secrets, okay, now trade secrets actually is the exact opposite, okay, because trade secrets, the kind of way of seeing them is that I keep my secrets. When my secrets are the bag, my value's over. But while my secret is being maintained inside, okay, take the classic example of the Coca-Cola recipe, then I've got value. The problem with trade secrets in this context is that they aren't being shared with the masses, okay? Now, don't get me wrong. There are many clients who are encouraged to keep their trade secrets. But I'm thinking in this context of this uh, climate tech revolution that we need to have in order to mitigate the changes in the world, I've got a feeling almost like a bit of anti-trade trade secreting these days because they're hiding your technology from the world who so badly needs it. And we know that the, this thing is global. We need to all get technology. Now, we know most of our clients... Um, don't they aren't IBM who go and uh, patent in 120 countries or something? <clears throat> Most of them do it in one or two or three. Some of them in eight and ten. Some of them in 13 and 15 countries. It's expensive. You don't go around patenting everything in the world. And most countries in the world are not on the agenda. And most countries, therefore, are actually free to take technology and use it because there aren't patents in those countries. So the patent system offers a huge scope and um, to scale up technology and take it globally. But we don't want to miss that. We don't want to have a patent system that prevents that happening. And that is where my a lot of energy these days is focused on trying to get the right policies and the right procedures together to help to let IP help this and not hinder this. And so I'm hoping that we uh, have often spoken of working together. We can do this together, Ariel. Okay. No, it's definitely true. I just want to say that there's something, some sort of an assumption that has to be explicitly said here. Um, we cannot count on governments to make the change. Mm -hmm. There is something that you and I, you know, we, we understand it so well that we didn't even mention it. Whomever is going to make the change is not the governments. They will follow. It has to be companies, whether small startups, whether big ones who drive the economy. And those don't move without a financial incentive um and that's why in terms of trade secrets versus patents we have to come up with a model that will make it more beneficial for them to share their technology rather than to keep you know the cards close to the chest in that sense yeah interesting very interesting okay well the challenges are out there so uh we're gonna we're gonna try to meet them as much as we can that's okay true. now i'm gonna actually move towards closing because of our time and i want to kind of Take it out now. We've gone in, we've gone out, we've gone up and we've gone down. But if I had to ask you, you know, Ariel, you're walking in the desert, okay, down south, and it's really hot and dry, okay, and you're sweating, and you're wondering how you're going to survive this experience. And then suddenly falls next to your foot a bottle, and you open it up, and there's a genie in that bottle. And the genie says, Ariel, you've got three wishes. How would you want to change the world? What do you think you, could, <laughs> what do you, think you would ask for? Well, I, I think that's that's a good question because um, I've been in that desert and I did not get that bottle. So, um, yeah, my officer's course was down in the Negev, um, yeah, which is a desert. And, uh, yeah, I did wish to get a bottle but of water. Uh, and that <laughs> probably would be my first wish to get some fresh water. But seriously, now, I'll tell you, in terms of of changing the world, there are so many things, but if we focus on this specific aspect that we've been dealing with, the green focus, I think that my wish would be for people with long-term vision to be the policy makers or the decision makers in that sense, because we have a, a, an inherent problem in whatever country you're talking about is that people who actually make the decisions are elected for a short term. And the problems that we've been dealing with are a result of a long-term, I'd call it non-thinking, right? We saw it coming up, but nobody cared enough to actually invest money in, in, in solving it or preventing it or whatever. So now we're kind of trying to, to fix the situation, but 
for me, I think the change would come if people with long-term vision would make would be able to make decisions because you know on the on the other hand you know i i can't i can't blame them because they are elected for a short term everybody's expecting to see yeah. the results and if you can only you, you have one pie you're going to divide it somehow how much are you going to give to long term solutions if you need to show short term results right so we have an inherent problem in the way humankind has built the governmental system, which kind of makes sense because you don't want a tyrant for 50 years, but on the other hand, everybody who's elected for four years, even if it's over and over again, it's the same type of thinking. Uh, and since we're focusing on green stuff, I think this is one of the wishes that I would actually make the genie solve how to do it properly. But uh, you know, long-term solutions, cannot come only from short-term thinking. Okay, well, you've thrown out a big challenge because that one needs a genie in a half because uh, I think we're all seeing around us, you know, in Israel, we've got an election season arriving again. Yes. Um, not only, as you said, it's short-term, but in some places it's really short-term. <laughs> it's a few months at a time. <laughs> so somehow our environmental ministries, for example, which also are politically driven, but... They are ministries which should survive different governments, and there should be a lot of professionals there who are thinking long term, who could be driving agendas and have the politicians come in and go out and not really get in the way. Okay, um, because as you said, it's really challenging. We've got long term interests we all want to meet, and as we see now, the crisis in Europe, for example, with the war, um, you know, suddenly short term stuff happens and wars happen, and it sets us back. Um, I have got this romantic vision about humans kind of aligning themselves around the big vision because it's a concern for all of us. And we need to almost, I've got a whole, I've got a whole thing about this. I'll come out later in another podcast about them, but um, we need to have a shared vision. Okay. And we need to encourage that because people around and whether we've come from backward cultures, forward cultures, more modernized, less modernized, we kind of all see that we are sharing one world. Okay. And it's not good enough to just kind of like, well, you and you and you and you and play the blame game. We need to really come to the table, all of us, even small countries like Israel, which have got quite a minor carbon footprint in the big scheme of things. But less like individuals like me and you, we may be pushing for big transformative things to happen. But we also need to change our lifestyles to be better examples and to make a small difference. Cumulatively, we make a big difference. So I think we're going to end it with that. It's been great speaking to you and catching up again. And uh, there's infinite, I think, that we could speak about. And we will continue offline. And I want to thank you for being here sharing your vision and your ideas uh, eloquently with the listeners thank uh, you. wishing you and all of us you know much good luck in the future uh, we'll be in touch soon and there's any you. last message you want to give to the people before you say goodbye yeah, well I first I first want to thank you for inviting me uh, on this awesome podcast I think it's it's a great idea great concept great issue to deal with and I want to invite every person to just think a bit about our future and you know we have as i mentioned our fridge but what's going to happen beyond that what's going to happen with our kids what's going to happen with our grandkids you know so let's do something everybody does their part and we'll see a better future all right great good luck to the world thank you very much and all the best have a great day